John Gabriel. I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Hamilton County in Cincinnati. I'm interviewing Roy Norris today on August 9th, 2007 at the Main Library downtown Cincinnati. Our camera operator is Dennis Daly. Welcome, Mr. Norris. Thank Thanks you for sir. being here. Let's start with a little background uh, on what you, where you grew up, what you did before the war, how you heard about, uh, say, Pearl Harbor, or you got into the military. Uh, I was born here in Cincinnati. Uh, uh, my father was a, uh, an office manager. We got transferred around different places, Cincinnati and Indiana, mm. but uh, basically since he's home. Great. Uh, how old were you when the war broke out? I was uh, 20 and 41. I was, uh, excuse me, in uh, February the 11th, 1922, I was born. Okay. As uh, my mother tells me. <laughs> she keeps sorry ever since. Oh boy. Um, I was the only boy. Okay. The rest were girls. Oh no. But uh, uh, we lived in Cincinnati most of the time. Uh, I also lived, we lived in Circleville, Ohio, mm -hmm. which is uh, up below Columbus and above Chillicothe. Yeah, yeah. Round town. Round town. I uh, completed high school there. And uh, we moved here to Cincinnati, hometown. And I uh, went to work at uh, Cons as an office boy. And uh, in fact, uh, when that, uh, uh, with Pearl Harbor, uh, come uh, February of 42, uh, uh, I had a discussion with my dad. and. Uh, I told him I thought I'd like to get in the service. And uh, he was an old ground pounder also. Was he? World War II, the Rainbow Division. And uh, so uh, he said, well, you have to make your own decision and go with it. So I said, OK. And I tried to take the aviation cadet exam. They had changed the requirements for years to get into the aviation you had to have at least two years of college hmm. and to apply. Well, all I had was high school. Uh, but by then, after the war began, they left that off. And all you had to do was uh, meet the academic uh, requirements and pass a written test. Uh, so I tried that. Mm -hmm. I didn't make the written test. So with that, the decision was uh, what to do now, and I said, well, my mind's turned towards the direction of getting in the service, and I went down and enlisted. And at that time, the 82nd All-American Division was activated down in Louisiana. Hmm. Uh, and uh, when I enlisted then, uh, that's where I was sent. Uh, rode down Pullman cars, but uh, uh, that was the beginning of the 82nd All-American Division. That's the division that Sergeant York was in. Uh -huh. and this was still in 1942? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, uh, we went to Claiborne, Louisiana, and uh, we were there uh, as an infantry division. Uh, come August, we were shipped to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and we became airborne. Airborne. I was not a paratrooper. I was a dogfish. We became airborne infantry. And uh, the uh, various Battalions of paratroopers at Bragg became part of the 82nd Airborne. I remember the 505 and 506 regiments that became part of 82nd Airborne. Mm -hmm. um, as time progressed in, in our call it basic training and so forth, uh, they reorganized the uh, 82nd 
and took quite a few of the NCOs and they started the 101st Airborne. This is all at Bragg. And uh, uh, at that time I was a corporal. I had a 60-millimeter uh, mortar squad, seven of us, myself mm -hmm. and six uh, fellows. Uh, and we went through a lot of training of uh, getting in a glider framework of wood and then getting out with all our gear. Uh, you've seen pictures of the CG-4A glider. Uh, the nose where the pilots were raised up like this. Mm -hmm. You could put a Jeep in there or a 75 millimeter artillery. That's about the heaviest they could haul. But uh, my squad and I had a glider to ourselves, so to speak. We had what was called a dog cart, which had aluminum framing, T-handle, and bicycle wheel tires. And we carried our, our ammunition uh, for us, the mortar, and uh, a couple boxes of 30s for the platoon we were in. And uh, we carried these five-gallon water camps mm -hmm. on this little cart. Uh, the idea was there was only seven of us, but upon landing, the pilots would get out and raise the nose, and we pull our cart out and we're on our way. The first ride, with no gear, you're sitting on plywood seats, plywood floor. I don't think we even had seat belts then. And uh, the uh, First ride as we came around and made our final approach, we are doing fine. Because these, not one of us of the seven of the patrol had ever been in the air before. No kidding. So you can imagine. <laughs> uh, when we landed, uh, the pilots did a good job, but one of the wheels, the right front wheel, uh, hit one of these truck ruts, and it was a tripod assembly there, snapped it off and came up through the wood floor, climate <laughs> floor, <laughs> first ride. <laughs> okay. But uh, after that, we uh, did this several times. The paratroopers would be the defense, and then we'd have to go down and determine where they were after we got out of the glider uh -huh. and go do our thing. Uh, being a mortar squad, we're not on the front line, but we're behind the lines of whatever, whatever uh, platoon we were assigned to. How far behind the, the front line would you say? You didn't I couldn't that? tell you anymore. Um, you have a lot of range with the 60. Uh, no, I couldn't tell you anymore. Because that's one thing you have to be careful with, with mortars. Uh, they don't always go as far as you want them to. Mm. They had little increments you could put in the fin to give it more range. Could have was a rocket, is yeah. all it was. Yeah. But, uh, uh, that, that's about it as far as that goes. But anyway, being at Fort Bragg uh, on days off, weekends sometimes, I'd go over to the uh, Pope Field and see if I could get a ride in an airplane. Because uh, I was always a model buff. I built everything you could imagine as a model. And uh, there was a notice on one of the bulletin boards uh, about the Air Force now reducing the requirements hmm. for aviation cadets. Didn't have to have college. I went and took my test and passed it. Hmm. And uh, in uh, February of uh, 43, yeah. Uh, I took the test, this time the written test, and passed it. And uh, by the end of February, I was gone. And your unit said, it's okay, we'll let you go uh, in the airport? Well, we don't have any choice. Oh, okay. No, no. they, to <laughs> lower their requirements, they were short of pilots. So that was one of the answers for it. So at any rate, uh, with that, I kissed all the guys goodbye and uh, uh, left them and went to Maxwell Field where they had the pre-flight, they called it, mm -hmm. uh, where 
we went to school and we learned avionics, weather, uh, and all that type of information necessary to fly. Uh, it was all ground. Of course, uh, cadets in the Air Corps were very much like West Point or any other academy, strictly racked up all the time. Uh, and uh, uh, it was all schooling mm -hmm. for uh, aeronautics, uh, weather, and whatever. Uh, when that was completed, we then went to basically the first opportunity to fly. And I was transferred to Door Field, Florida, not far from Lake Okeechobee. And we flew the uh, Yellow Perils, they call them, that was the twi uh, biplane Yellow Wings Blue fu Fuselage. And uh, that was our first introduction uh, to flying. How long did you have to sit through all your classroom instruction before you got to go down to get in the yellow paper? Uh, I'm trying to remember. No, I didn't make any special note of the time. Usually, pre-flight, as they called it, I think it lasted almost two months. But probably a good guess for it. Okay. About two months. And it was all academics in regard to weather and so forth. Mm -hmm. No hands-on. No hands-on, okay. Yeah. And of course, we're all, you know, uh, we were impatient. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, after that, uh, we were shipped to, to, the, to uh, a primary school, which was Door in Florida, flying the Yellow Peril. And uh, there you had an instructor who sat in the front seat and you in the back and you wore a helmet that had tubes attached to it and the instructor talked in a, in a uh, like a funnel. Uh -huh. There was no electronics involved. And uh, he could talk to you, but all you could do is shake your head. And uh, you were always in the back seat and he was in the front. Uh, and uh, they took their lives in their hands with us guys. Do you remember your first flight? Oh, very much so. First thing I did after I landed the thing, now he's on the stick with me, and we came in, and you have very narrow landing gear, the, the nose and, the tail, and then a rear tail wheel. And uh, first thing I did was ride the rudder, right rudder a little more because of the torque from the prop, the engine. And uh, it makes you want to go left, so you're riding a little right rudder. And I did a ground loop. You know, just like this. So I was on the list already. Oh, no. Uh, anyway, uh, he immediately, I got it. So I let go, and he took right off, and we went around, and she, he gave it to me once we got it, pattern altitude, and uh, let's do it again without the ground loop. <laughs> uh, this guy's had a lot of patience, I'll tell you. So uh, then uh, shot another, shot the second time and did fine. Uh, once you got all the feeling and knowledge of what you were handling and so forth, because he was on the phone all the time, you know, talking to you. Uh, uh, some, some fellas uh, apparently didn't have enough feel in their feet through their shoes. Cloud hoppers is what we had on. And they would tell them, take your shoes off mm. and fly barefoot. So these guys would get the feel of that. And it was true, it, it had an effect. Okay. But uh, uh, we went to a uh, uh, an auxiliary field, which was higher than the normal field. Bear in mind down there is swampy. And they would, uh, condone off a big square with barbed bar wire, and it was high above the level of the normal pasture, because there were always cattle out there. And that was our landing place, and it was big enough that you could use a steerman in there, put it in, take it out. And uh, when I got cleared to solo, uh, I wasn't doing too good on my check ride, and he finally didn't say anything got out 
And uh, he says, well, I can't stand, like, I'm, I'm trying to remember the words, uh, I can't stand this anymore. You're going to kill me, or some words of that effect. <laughs> and uh, said, I'm going to walk back. He did. He walked, the, the engine's still turning. I'm sitting there. And he walked over to the gate. They had a gate on it because of the animals in the pastures. And he, it was psychological. This is what it was, psychology. And he opened the gate. I saw him walk through. He turned around. And, you know, uh, he, he was working on me. <laughs> and uh, he was walking out the road. So, okay. So I turned the thing around, got in the right direction for the wind, and took off. And, uh, of course, I'm watching him down there all the time. He's still walking. So, uh, psychology is twisting it. Right. So, at any rate, uh, I went around, made a real short pattern, and beautiful landing. He turned around, came back through the gate, called me over, and I didn't turn it off. It was a little chuggy along. And uh, he got <clears throat> back in, take me home. That's all he said. And uh, I went and I landed at the door field all right. Of course, you imagine there's a whole bunch of guys landing at the same time in this oh, big yeah. field. Yeah. And uh, so we put it down and I parked it then. His name was Ladue. And he was an old army pilot. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, I say that now because uh, as the story goes, he was real good with the cadets. Each, each instructor had approximately six students. So he had the tails in the air quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, but after we got very accustomed to the airplane, he decided he could solo. And he'd say, use psychology again. Uh, Gee, I can't stand any more of this. Go ahead, you know, something like that. Just to go. And uh, I got to solo. And you, you can't imagine the enthusiasm I'm by myself. You know, there's nobody there to help me out, guide me, what have you. Yeah. But uh, then we went through training of shooting landings, and then they showed us how to also shoot crosswind landings and so forth. The instructor would be there with you. And uh, once you soloed, uh, uh, you were not supposed to fly formation. We're a bunch of dodos, you know. And uh, anytime we got away from the field, court, you know, <laughs> and Ledoux would get in each, uh, each hour with the instructor would be something new introduced. And uh, uh, I was up with him one time, and uh, I forgot what where our maneuver was at the time, but uh, he, he pointed. And I looked over, and oh, there were three or four of them flying formation. Yeah, they, so he ducked down in the cockpit, and he said, go over there and, and get into the formation. <laughs> uh, these guys were all sold by themselves. So I did, I slid in, and it was fine, and he pops up in the seat, and, <laughs> and they see him, and boy, they just went everywhere. Because <laughs> you weren't supposed to do that. But uh, those are some of the, the things that went on. And uh, I would have to say the instructors were extremely patient. And their lives were in your hand. Was, were there any accidents? No. Good. Not during my time. Uh, but once you soloed, uh, you got dumped in the pool. And you, as you came for going back to your abode, why, they, the, guy, the guys would grab you that had soloed throw you in the pond. The uh, primary base was like a uh, current a motor motel that has a swimming pool and nice uh, buildings with maybe uh, two occupants um, side by side. And it was great life. But that was primary. And uh, we had a half a day of school, half a day of flying. We learned how the airplane flew, why it flew. We learned about the engine, why it worked, how it worked. I learned about torque uh, on the ground and the car. You don't pay any attention to it. But if you ever watch that engine in there, when you step on a the gas, that whole thing leans because of the torque. Hmm. 
of it trying to apply that power to something that's got to move. So at any rate, uh, we went through the schooling, and I don't recall the hours. I, I was going to look it up and I forgot to. Uh, but after we completed the required hours, uh, that class, which was 44A, which meant we would graduate January 1944. So at any rate, the whole shebang were shipped to the basic school, which was in Greenville, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And there we flew Volte vibrators. Uh, planes get a name. Uh, this is a low wing, blue fuselage, yellow wings. The landing gear was stationary and it had a long greenhouse for a pilot and co-pilot. Um, they called it the vibrator because uh, you, as far as the prop goes, you either had your prop full forward so that you got a very small amount of cut into the air to pull you forward. Uh, or when you pulled it back, it was a, a real steep blade, which uh, you could hear the windows rattle. Mm. But uh, uh, as I said, it was a low wing, not too, you had more power. I don't know, I, something I didn't finish looking up. The power on the vaulty vibrator. Uh, I have pictures of them to show you if that would help. But uh, we went through basic there, and uh, this is where uh, you've seen pictures, I'm sure, in the movies of uh, pilots walking around a ramp with a chute on their back and chutes bumping their tail. That's punishment. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I went through it a couple of times. <laughs> you had to walk tours, as they called it, if you goofed off or the instructor uh, had to write you up for doing it wrong or not listening and so forth. Uh, you might get a tour of an hour walking on a certain area and the chute's beating the devil out of your back of your legs. Oh, and, boy. But anyway, uh, I served my time. <laughs> Um, uh, we are, were also at that time introduced into formation flying and uh, uh, of course most of us had tried it already as a, as a primary but uh, this is basic and uh, again we did the same thing we, when we get away from the base everybody tucks in that good, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the basic when it was completed uh, they had a graduation ceremony, and uh, uh, certain ones of us, me being one of them, uh, flew a formation over the base when the rest of the class were having their graduation. So uh, I did a good job there. Good. Anyway, uh, with that completed, we went to Napier Field uh, in Alabama and Dothan, Alabama, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we were in advanced school, and there we flew the T-6 Texan. Uh, in all realistic, that airplane with guns on it was a fighter. Well, it uh, had about 450 horse on it, and uh, you could do almost anything with it. When did, you, when did you start taking your gunnery practice and things like that? Uh, yeah, we'll come to that. Okay. Uh, Anyway, um, in the uh, AT-6, was at Napier Field, as I said, uh, uh, we had an instructor sat in the back seat, and you were in the front. Uh, your wheels collapsed, and uh, had good power, had about 450 horse on And you had full control of pitch and throttle, and uh, I'm trying, I can't recall, as I said, I did, didn't follow through on it, the speeds, but uh, as we progressed through advanced school, uh, we took off in formation and landed in formation. Mm -hmm. that's, that's difficult uh, because you did just power off and uh, you, know, you, you, you turn to get out of the way. But uh, uh, that was really enjoyable, uh, at least to me anyway. And uh, uh, as a cadet flying T-6s, 
for night flying, that's when we first got into night flying, and you have navigation lights on the wingtips and on the tail underneath. And uh, uh, you went daytime cross countries and so forth. You had to go to A, B, C, and D. And there would always be an instructor in his airplane sitting out there at that corner counting heads. You know, typical. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's more on that in a minute. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, after we completed advance, they again had a flyover of the class. I got in the flyover again, the formation. And I never did stand a parade at the end, thank goodness. But anyway, uh, after we completed that, we graduated January 1944, and that's Class 44A. And uh, after graduation, uh, they went everywhere. Uh, I stayed and was an instructor, became an instructor. And uh, uh, I think I had six or eight, I forgot which, make it six. I uh, yeah, I think I did have eight a couple times, but six cadets that I had to teach all the same things I just had been taught. Uh, in the meantime, when we were not instructing on a weekend, uh, we were free to do as we pleased. Uh, our base commander, Anyway, our base commander had uh, uh, in storage what they called Fairchilds. It was a low wing, two open cockpits, uh, cloth covered with an inline engine in the front end. And it was a, really a primary trainer. I had flown the Stearman, which was a biplane, mm -hmm. a primary trainer. And uh, he had them in storage on the base. And uh, he left the instructors then flying on weekends. And we would take base personnel rides in them. They would be in the front seat and you're in the back. It's open, it's open cockpit. Uh, I'm coming to this because of a, just a story. Uh, so uh, on Sunday on the weekends, we were allowed as instructors to fly those. And we'd take the base personnel for rides. Uh, one time I had the base physical ed instructor, one of these guys like this, you know, and uh, he sat in the front seat and I was in the back, and I had flown a number of times with others, and uh, including the chaplain, that's another story. But uh, uh, this guy, when he got in the front seat, the crewman usually would look down and make sure he had all his strap, his seat belt on and over shoulder straps, and uh, I never paid any attention to it, because that was his responsibility, although I'm the pilot. So anyway, uh, took him up, and we were tooling around, and uh, picked up some other guys tooling around. I can't remember the river that runs north and south there between Alabama and, and uh, uh, Georgia. S escapes me now. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, with those passengers, would get down on the riverbed uh, between the trees and uh, just to scare the who's ever in the front seat. And if the bridge was high enough, we'd go under. Oh, boy. You know, we were young. Anyway, uh, I had get, met some others up there and we did uh, maneuvers and close formation and everything. And uh, we got back and we landed and this guy didn't get out of the seat. So I got out, stepped on the wing, went up to him. The inside of that was a metal tubular frame with a cloth covering. There was a crossbar right in front of where he sat. He had his hands like this. He didn't have his belt on. Oh. We had to pry his hands off. <laughs> For this, I got my butt chewed. Uh, but uh, 
Oh, he thought it was great. Very interesting. <laughs> but uh, I got my uh, tail chewed up by the uh, the uh, boss check pilot because he says he's your passenger. Anyway, but I had taken the chaplain for a ride. Uh, I don't know if you're Catholic or not, but uh, I am, and I used to serve mass for whoever the the uh, preacher was for the. The, wherever base I was, I was a server. But at any rate, I took him for a ride. He got sick one time because we were horse playing. Uh -huh. We had to go land in an auxiliary field and get buckets and clean, <laughs> clean oh, up. No. <laughs> All these things happen, you know. But uh, can you remember his name? Hmm? Age is catching I'm 85. It's catching up with me. But at any rate, uh, that was through the school there. Uh, and after graduation from advance, uh, we were rated a pot, single engine pilot and a second John. Uh, we didn't have the flight officers yet. That was the blue bar. Uh, that hadn't come to pass as a, as a uh, there were so many second Johns, they started making them a flight officers. I've never heard that term, second John. Uh, second lieutenant. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, second lieutenant. Second job. The gold bar. Okay. But uh, anyway, as to, as time progressed, then I uh, I was instructing the T6s in advanced school, and I was flying from the rear, the student in the front, and uh, of course I did all the stunts that were pulled on me to my cadets. I had six of them. So I had to share my time. I, I didn't fly with each one every day, but uh, uh, you know you, it was spaced out, so sure. you might get one or two because you, you were flying all day, uh, and that most of the flights were only an hour long. And uh, that. after uh, I went back to the school as an instructor, and uh, when I left there. Okay, I went uh, to transfer to a freight of Washington and learned to fly the, the P-39, the Air Cobra. It was a killer, mm -hmm. I mean it. Uh, with the engine behind the pilot, the ba balance was very precarious. Uh, most airplanes, because of the engine, the weight's in the front. Uh, if they uh, stall out, go into a spin, they spin with the nose down. The P-39, because of its balance, it spinned either flat or with the tail down. Hmm. Uh, there were six of us assigned to an instructor for the P-39. And uh, uh, we would take turns uh, with an instructor flying next to us because he couldn't get in the same airplane. <laughs> I'm a small guy, so he can man. Anyway, uh, as time progressed, several guys bought the farm because of the flat spin. They'd get in a flat spin, they'd recover, and go right in the other way. And uh, in that time of flying the P-39, there were eight fellows bought the farm. Couldn't get out and hit the silver. All the way in. In fact, the group I chummed with, uh, one of ours, we, we had signed off at Efreda, supply everybody to leave to go to Van Nuys, California. And uh, we all got, uh, we bought a car, mm. a four door Chevy with. Uh, spare wheels and the, uh, tires and the fender. Uh -huh. I was the oldest, so it was in my name. We paid 125 bucks for it. And being the oldest, I was the one who got stuck with the license. But anyway, uh, we were going to drive it all the way down to Van Nuys, from the middle of Washington State down to LA. And uh, we all signed out that we're leaving the base, and they grabbed the one. 
you owe us 45 minutes. You didn't get all your time in. Mm. So we said, we'll wait. And uh, we'd all signed out already. He bought the farm. On that flight? Were you watching at the time? Yeah. Oh, boy. Was he, he was spinning? Just like uh, talking about? We saw him way in the distance. And the first thing that came to everybody's mind, he's in a flat spin. And uh, he got out, but he got out. His chute must have just opened and he hit the ground. Oh, wow. So he was not in it, he was out. When they're spinning like that, they're hard to get out. Right. Particularly with a 39, because it's so little space. He got a real small door and so forth. So we lost one out of the six. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we drove down to Van Nuys, uh, California, and P-38s. Oh, the king of the mill. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember his name. We had one of the movie actors that was an instructor. I can't remember his name. But it was during the time when Andy Devine was the mayor of Van Nuys. Have you heard of Andy, Andy Devine? Okay, my age is showing. But anyway, uh, the runway for Van Nuys was parallel to the main street in Van Nuys. Now it was a distance apart. Uh, I'm telling you that for another reason coming up. But uh, uh, we got a piggyback ride. Uh, behind the pilot in the 38, there's like a shelf because your, your teardrop canopy goes back. And that's for the radios we're all. But for the purpose of introdu introduction, they took the radios and moved them into the hall of the Craig, uh, that center part of the 30. We called it a gondola. Uh -huh. This is the gondola. Okay. And they moved it from under this canopy here back into the, the uh, gondola, as we call it. Anyway, we sat over the pilot like this for our first ride. Oh boy. And uh, first thing he did when he got upstairs, we were clear, plenty high, he shut an engine off. And he flew around on one engine. Just to show you, hey, because that was the scare. You can't go anywhere on one. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. You can't. Huh. Because uh, I got I had to fly out of Europe on one. Anyway, uh, uh, we did our flying there. And uh, do you remember the movie Burma Passage? It had Earl Flynn in it and so forth, a bunch of paratroopers. They used Van Nuys for the base of them loading the airplane. They had a Goonie Bird there, C-47, uh, DC-3. Uh, and they would be dressed for the, this, this part of the movie when all these paratroopers loaded onto the uh, C-47. So we all got to sit around and watch. <laughs> but uh, I can't remember the, the star's name that was there. But anyway, um, after we learned how to fly the, uh, the 38, uh, we would go up in formation of what was called a flight. You have a leader, number one. Number two is his wingman. There's a number three sits back here and a number four over here on his wing. The idea being one and two look out here. Three and four are responsible for over here because they have to look right to see us. Mm -hmm. We have to look left to see them. And that way you cover your tail. They use a better word. But mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, that's a flight formation. And we used that in combat all the time. Uh, by having two as a flight, two in a flight, we could break if you're just the four of us. So we're covering each other. These guys look here, and these guys look over here. And uh, if there's only two, you're flying like this, so you can cover each other's tail. Uh, but the... the uh, uh, <laughs> One time, we were climbing in formation like that through a thick overcast, north part, northern part of the Adriatic. We were going, I don't recall the target now, 
but we were flying here. We were in clouds. I could see him. Uh, I couldn't see the rest of him. Mm -hmm. He was that, that thick. And uh, all of a sudden, my left engine quit. Now I'm in, in weather about 20,000 feet. When that engine stops, that down you go. And all I hollered was, I'm going home. I had a uh, mic button on my wheel. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, we had a, a ma oxygen mask on with a mic in it. And I just said, I'm going home. And uh, somebody, the next guy took over. But anyway, as I fell down through here, I was tumbling. This thing went every which way you can imagine. I was covered with ice. Then I was covered with snow. And then I was, it was raining. I was in the middle of a thunderstorm. And I popped out of the bottom. Guess what's up there? Water. I was upside down. Oh, boy. So I immediately rolled it over. The left engine is dead because as soon as that happened, I shut everything off in the, the, the blades here. You turn them like this. I didn't know you could do So that. it won't rotate. Huh. See? And uh, that's what I, as soon as that happened, that's the first thing you do. You shut the thing off. And uh, I popped out. Oh, God, there's water. <laughs> so I rolled it over and uh, took my headings and headed south. Go, I was going back to the base. That was the only abort mission I ever flew that was caused mechanically. And uh, of course, when I got back, I complained to my favorite people, my crew chief, and he just looked at me. Tall Texan. He at least, I only came up to his shoulders. And what did you say? And I'd tell them the story. You know how they, oh, they, they worked it pretty good. And uh, so they checked it out. They started up, ran fine. Uh, beautiful. I want you to take that thing up again now, which I ended up doing. And I did everything I could think of, but I wasn't in any weather. I racked it around and everything, uh, trying to cause problems in the flow of gas or oil or what have you. Everything was fine. Huh. So when I got back, I apologized to him. I said, maybe it was my fault, but I couldn't get it to do anything. But the part is, when you're in weather like that, the moisture is very high, uh, with the clouds, it could have been rain or ice that even got into the coolers. You have to bear in mind, these little doodads on the side here are radiators for coolant. There's one on each side of each boom. The oil cooler picks up air right here underneath the spinners. This little tube that you see over here is the pickup of air for the carburetor. It could have caused by yeah. several things. Yeah, yeah. But at any rate, uh, that's what happened on that occasion. That was the only abort that I ever did that uh, I came home <laughs> on one engine. I've heard things about the P-38 having trouble pulling out of a dive. Is that uh, experience too? I'm coming to this. Oh, yes, yes. Um, not so much coming out of it, but getting into it. But at any rate, uh, you must bear in mind that uh, those props, you know, the, the engines are, t are turning opposite direction. And of course, the pitch of the blade is, is changed. Mm -hmm. uh, these are turned this way, and those are turned this way. Don't go by the models. Right. I have not seen a model of the 38 in any size or form that had the props uh, right and left. They're both the same on these models. Uh -huh. I'm picking. But anyway, um, see. Yeah. Okay. Um, we flew the 38s. For bomb runs, we had a main shackle right underneath here. See where the belly tanks are. And then there were two smaller ones on each side. We carried a thousand pounder on the main ones and a 500 pounder on each side of that one. Wow. wow. Okay? These are 165 gallon gasoline tanks. We also have a 300 gallon. And you'd think you were flying with somebody and they, because they stuck way out here. So that's, that's 
twice the load of gas. Anyway, uh, on a mission to Venice, we had full load of bombs. 2,000 pounders and four five hundreds under there. And as we pulled, we are flying fire formation scattered all over the sky. We all tucked in tight like bombers do. And we neared what is called the IP. That's the initial point where the bombardier takes over. <laughs> we don't have a bombardier. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we fly like fighters going up there. We're all over the sky. All tuck in. And we're approaching Venice. And there's flat. Luckily, uh, they were behind it. It was all bursting behind us. Now, we're a box of uh, my box. There were, uh, let's see, was that eight? Eight? The other four. There'd be eight of us in our box. And there were eight more behind it, all tucked in like this. All of a sudden, there, these flat was bursting. But behind us, all of a sudden, this one guy goes like this. One of the anti-aircraft shells went through his wing, right behind the bomb, and lifted him out of the formation. It did not explode. Wow. He just went like this. He had a hole back there. Oh, I guess that hole was about like this by the time that thing tore through there. And that's a reserve tank of gas. See, you can see the gas. Uh -huh. And that's the real one. Lifted him right out of formation. Did he head out? Oh yeah. <laughs> if that had gone off, six airplanes would have disappeared. Oh boy. That's oh. the closest I, I was, I've ever been. Wow. Wow. Uh, okay. Um, my time, at, oh, when I, I had a, a return, uh, when we flew as, as a uh, squadron, there, there could have been uh, eight of us, or there could have been 16 of us in a squadron to fly. That'd be the largest size. So this time, there was just uh, two flights. We were strafing uh, a railroad yard up in Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. in the northern part of Yugo. I can't remember the town. I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, and what happens? Uh, one flight is assigned to be top cover. The other flight goes down and does the work. Uh, and at the same time, they're shooting flak at the guys upstairs. Uh, uh, I'm flying along there, and they call out. Uh, I have the top flight, and they call out flak at six. Boom, boom, boom. Wham! I got hit, completely flipped over. Wow! And uh, as soon as that happens, why well, they check each other out. And over here in my left engine, about midway uh, in the wing, uh, there was a big hole into the counting over there you could put your head in. Nobody else got hit. Huh. So with that, and liquid was leaking out, and the first thing you look at is the oil pressure and the temperature and so forth, because they would respond real quick, because that's the liquid cooled. So, uh, uh, my wingman checked me out and said, you got a hole you can put your head in. So, okay, you got it, I'm going home. I mean, hand signals were typical. And uh, I turned around and headed for home. Uh, now, we're up in northern Yugo, Yugo oh, up past Yugo, uh, the name escapes me, jeez. Oh, anyway, so I headed home. Now, I have to go across the mountains, east, uh, west, and then over the Adriatic to get to Foggia, Italy. Oh. See, we were in the Foggia Valley there. If you picture the bump on the back of the Italian leg, that's a mountain, San Giovanni Mountains there. And uh, uh, to the west of that is a big Foggia Valley. The 15th Air Force had that whole valley, the bombers and ourselves. Uh, anyway, uh, with that, uh, I had the thing feathered. And uh, I was tooling along one, and I came across a B-17 that had two out on one side. Mm. And they were still throwing stuff out. You could see it was ammunition belts because it was long. And uh, now, this airplane has a generator and a battery. The left engine is where they are. Oh. 
So I don't have one. So I don't have any earphones. I couldn't. And my electric compass, I had turned it off because it, I, it would draw juice from the battery. And uh, so anyway, I'm tooling along and here's this B-17. They're still throwing stuff away. And I motioned to them and they knew what I meant. And uh, I stayed with them until we came to the point where we were uh, about the middle of Hugo and at real high mountains there near the uh, Adriatic. And uh, so uh, I motioned to them and so forth. I'm going. And uh, uh, I left them. They, they had turned and were going south down the valley, which meant they weren't going up. They were just going to put it in someplace. Uh, so I made it over, over there. And uh, while I was climbing to get up there, I thought, hmm, I don't know if I'm going to get over those suckers. So I started the left one up again. And the oil pressure was low and so forth. It ran, though, and everything was under control. So I climbed over, and uh, I'm tooling away across the mountains. I come to the Adriatic. Vista Island is, if you've heard of Sarajevo, it's just west of there. A whole bunch of little teeny islands. This was shaped like an artist's palette, you know, that funny weird shape. Yeah. And where that indentation is for the, the artist there, that was the valley that ran through. And if we didn't want to go across the Adriatic, we dumped it there. It was a graveyard. It had anything you can imagine. Anyway, uh, I called in, and I had two fans going, uh, reference to the prop. And uh, they said, you got to wait your turn. OK, now look, I feathered the left engine, called emergency. I mean, I'm serious. And uh, I just snuck in between two, I don't know, it was uh, Spitfires or Hurricanes. I just squeezed in between two of them. I'm on one engine.